Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome back to Z Learning right here at Riverbanks Zoo and Garden. My name is Milo and I have the pleasure of leading yet another Lunch and Z Learn feature. So if you're on your lunch break, go ahead and get your lunch out because we are going to be meeting one of our, I guess, most native animals here at the zoo. And I say most native because this individual is actually extremely common here throughout the state of South Carolina and actually much of the United States. Today, all the teaser you all got was that we are talking about native snakes today, which is an important topic, especially because it is a beautiful day here in Columbia. It is sunny weather, it is bright weather, it is snake weather. But I wanna say hi to all of you returners. Look at all of you tuning in, it is so great. Let me scroll through and find all these names. Piper, nice to see you. Oh, Christina, Maxim, Faith, oh my gosh. Ashley, Andrew, Jackie, Tiffany, thanks for joining in first. It is so great to see all of you today live for a special animal ambassador feature. I'm actually down at our Riverbanks farmyard, mainly because we wanted to pick a native animal. So instead of being in far off places, it's a beautiful day. We're going to do our animal encounter right outside. In fact, we're going to be inside of our grandpa's garden, just right across from our big barn area right behind me. And I'm going to actually be joined by a familiar face for Z Learning. Her name is Ashton. She's actually our full entire zoo swing keeper. I'll have her explain that in a second though, of course, when she fully introduces herself. But Ashton, if you remember way back when to, gosh, November, she did our Thanksgiving feature with our tortoises when we fed King Tut a very nice little salad. But today, Ashton has a different sort of reptile that she will introduce us to here in a second. But good afternoon, everybody. It is so great to see all of you. Kathy, Rebecca, oh, all of you familiar faces. Welcome back. Oh, and howdy to you, Jonathan. Thanks for tuning in live for Lunch and Z-Learn. Let's go ahead and head on over. And I wanna introduce all of you, if you haven't met her yet, Ashton. I'll turn around the camera. Hi guys, how are you? Nice to see you, Ashton. Thanks so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure. Well, it's a beautiful day, so no complaints whatsoever. Now, I have to ask Ashton, you get asked this all the time. What is your job? Give us the, the, the quick synopsis. We could talk forever about all the things you okay, do. <laughs> so basically my job, I am a zookeeper, but I'm what's called a swing keeper. So I actually help out all of the different area here, areas here at the zoo. Okay. Uh, so I'm trained in like eight different areas and wow. tons of different routines so I can get thrown in anywhere and be able to help out with any animal. Okay, so what area are you working in today? Today I'm in the farm. You're actually in the farm? Yeah, oh, that's I'm perfect. You didn't have to go very far. Okay, yeah, so then perfect. what about tomorrow? What department are you in tomorrow? I am in the bird department. Oh, you had to think about yes, it for I a second. I never know. I mean, when you're a swing keeper, you are literally bird, <laughs> reptile, farm, yeah. hoofstock, you name it, you're all around the zoo. But I love the chaos. Wonderful. Well, and clearly you manage it well. Ashton has been here now for over five years. I was going to say, I know Ashton and I started right around the same time. So today, Ashton, we're going to be talking about kind of a farm animal. Some of you might be familiar with them as an animal ambassador, but Ashton, let me go ahead. I'll turn back around this camera because I want to talk to some more of you. Ashton's going to get out our animal friend here in a second, but David Carson Kelly is so great to see all of you. We are right here in grandpa's garden and I have to give a shout out to our horticulture department because they are very clearly working in this area. There's new dirt, new soil, things are getting turned up. In fact, actually, while Ashton is getting them out, I want to show you, look at these planters filled with all different sorts of veggies. Now I won't claim to be an expert, but I'm going to guess we got a mix of collards, arugulas, kales maybe even they're beautiful over here in grandma's garden oh ashton just mentioned oh there's some parsley there's some over here too and now later this month we actually have a full feature from our garden area so you'll be able to get all the updates from our horticulture staff themselves but right now i want to go ahead and go back to ashton because we're in the sunshine today ashton who do you have here introduce us i have dillinger with me today she is a black rat snake she is what's called an eastern black rat snake. So these guys range anywhere all the way up the east coast, but this is their southernmost range here in South Carolina. So they are super cool animals. This is one of these critters that you're gonna find all over the place down here in mm -hmm. South Carolina. So these are a really common snake that you will find in your own gardens and backyards at home. I was gonna say, it makes sense that we're in grandpa's garden yeah. because 
I'll be candid with you. I found black rat snakes in my own yard. Yeah, and I oh, live right here sure. in Columbia. They're I mean, here, I'm going to guess if any of you Z learners out there have ever seen a black rat snake out in the wild, send us a comment, raise your yeah, hand. Shout out. I want to hear from you. And I also want to know the black rat snakes that you've seen maybe around your natural areas, maybe even in your personal yard. Was it smaller, bigger? Did it look like Dillinger? Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question actually because bl black rat snakes are really cool uh, because rat snakes are actually a really big group of snakes. So there's a lot of different colors that can span in there. That's why we are particular to call her a black rat snake. Interesting. You can actually have a yellow rat snake, a red rat snake, even spotted rat snakes. It's pretty crazy. So Well, and I'm going to go out on the limb say, and yeah. they're not very creatively named. I'm going to no. guess yellow's <laughs> yellow, spotted, yeah. spotted, black yeah. is a black rat you snake. <laughs> now, I will be candid, though. We are in the full sunshine oh, right yes. now, and she doesn't look that black. She yeah. really does have quite the pattern on her. She does. She has a beautiful kind of mottled pattern, mm -hmm. and as you can probably guess, that is to help her camouflage. Absolutely. So snakes are just as vulnerable to predators as some other animals are in your garden. Um, so these guys would be hunting chipmunks and things like that. Sure. However, they could be hunted by a lot of different critters. So anything from raccoons to birds of prey is going to try to eat these guys. Anything that can pick them up and carry them off is going to try to get them. So she needs to stay nice and hidden in her habitat in the grasslands and the shrublands of South Carolina. Now, I'm so glad that you brought that up because a lot of times people think snakes, scary, yuck, yeah, they don't like them. Absolutely. Obviously, Ashton, you and I have a very different opinion of snakes. <laughs> and we understand the importance that they play in ecosystems. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But Tiffany, you had a great question. Her question actually is probably one that a lot of people are wondering. Yeah. Is their major food source rats? Yeah, you know what? That is probably <laughs> their name. And it's exactly. for a reason. They eat primarily rodents. So not necessarily sure. rats. They will branch out, eat a bunch of mice. They also really like amphibians. Toads and frogs are a big deal for these guys. Um, little rat snakes will eat a lot of tadpoles, um, small frogs, small lizards even. Um, and rats and mice, of course. So that is how they get their name because they are eating a lot of rodents, which leads into Milo's question, uh, yes. why they are important for us. If you yeah. see one of these in your backyard, it's probably because you have mice or rats or other rodents around. And these guys are gonna take care of that for you and make sure you do not have a rat problem or a rodent problem because they can eat a lot of rats in uh, one or two weeks, they can eat an entire colony. So they are really good pest control to have around. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, if you actually check out the caption here today, folks, for all of you South Carolinians out there, I know we have folks that tune in from all around the country, but if you're native here to South Carolina, like our black rat snakes are, we actually share the snake, the state, not the snake, we share the <laughs> we state the snake. with many snakes, a lot of S words today, <laughs> but we actually have about 30 different species of snakes all throughout the state of South Carolina. We're very lucky in that sense because of our warm climate. Mm -hmm. I know personally, I'm originally from Minnesota. We don't have nearly that number of snakes up there. Too chilly. But down here, we have about 30 different species. And Ashton was just telling me that there are about seven of those species that are considered venomous. Seven out of 30. That's really not that much. Mm -hmm. Ashton, I got to ask because some people at home are going to be wondering. Oh, for sure. Is she venomous? Is she poisonous? What's the difference? So she is not a venomous snake. There is a pretty big difference between being venomous or poisonous. Uh, so a poisonous animal is something that if you ingest or if you yes. touch it, then you will get that toxin inside of your body um, and it can cause harm. But poison, I'm sorry, venom is something that needs to be injected. So think like a scorpion or like a venomous snake. Yes. Um, so it is both harmful kind of scary yep. but honestly if you don't bother those animals they're not going to bother you absolutely in fact if you ever were to run into dillinger who is not a venomous snake uh, out in the wild rat snakes try to mimic um, some other snakes to be big and scary so that you leave them alone they don't want to bite you yep. well that's such a good point too and ashton always my go-to explanation is give wild animals personal space. Please. Everyone likes their personal space. People like their personal space, mm -hmm. but wild animals especially like a little bit of personal space. Yeah, now, it's their home. So we want to leave them to their home and let them do what they're going to do. Absolutely. Now, Rebecca, great question. In fact, we kind of breeze over. We talked a lot about Tiffany's question with, do they eat rats? Mm -hmm. Rebecca was wondering, do they eat fruits and vegetables? You know what? She is what's called an obligate carnivore, which is a super I love it. fun word, <laughs> uh, set of words to just explain that she can only eat meat. Yep. So she's not going to munch on any fruits and veggies, but that is an excellent question. 
But, and it's funny too, because there are numerous animals here at Riverbanks that are obligate carnivores, mm -hmm. like Ashton just talked about, which means they don't have a choice. They have to eat them. That's how their bodies are designed. Their digestive systems are not made to break down things like fruits and veggies, so they don't get the vegan option. No. They truly are <laughs> carnivorous, and that is the role that they play out in their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and scroll through, see if we have any other questions. Everyone's curious of what does Dillinger eat? Well, we talked a lot about wild snakes. Dillinger here at the zoo, what is she fed? So she is fed one mouse every other week. Okay. So that doesn't sound Whoa, like a lot wait of food. A second. Yeah. I know, Every other crazy? week, I could never, I could, yeah. I can't go from breakfast to lunch. Yeah, me neither, me neither. I just had a snack before. Exactly. <laughs> so that is actually because she is what's called cold-blooded. Mm. So she's endothermic, which is just the fancy scientific word for that you are going to be whatever temperature the world around you is. So she was cruising around in the sunshine, so she is nice and warm. It's about 70 degrees out here. So mm -hmm. she and her body is going to be about 70 degrees. But if I were to put her in the shade for a long period of time, she would get cooler and it would be harder for her to digest food and to do other things. Whereas our bodies are warm blooded. So we are ectothermic. I'm sorry, we are endothermic. She is ectothermic. Yep. Uh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we keep our bodies at a nice toasty 98.6 degrees mm -hmm. all the time. Right around that. Yep. yep. And that allows us to digest our food, to grow, to heal our wounds, anything like that. But she does not get that luxury. In order to get her energy, she needs to sit out in the sunshine and get warm. So that means that she doesn't need to keep up that energy level. So that's a pretty positive thing for all cold-blooded animals. Absolutely. But she really doesn't need to eat nearly as often as yep. we do. Because we eat to keep our energy level up to maintain that 98.6 exactly. degrees. It's all about those calories. It's yep. about the fuel, you could say. Yep. Oh, here. I'll wait just a little bit. We're going to have a golf cart moving past here in oh, a second. <laughs> But Tiffany, it's almost like you read Ashton's mind because you were wondering, she looks so relaxed here in the sunshine. She's soaking up all those rays. <laughs> and it definitely is because she's cold blooded because she is an ectotherm. ectotherm. Yep, yep. I got it wrong. I know, right, Ashton, I've had to pause. Ectotherm, <laughs> which means external, yes. means that she's soaking up all those nice warm rays today. And she looks beautiful. She's actually showing off some of those iridescent scales mm -hmm. too this morning. Now, I love all the questions that all of you are sending in. If for whatever reason I might be missing yours, we'll try to jump on them afterwards so that way you can get all your questions answered. But Dillinger is one of many animal ambassadors that we care for here at Riverbanks. And we actually have multiple other individuals that we're going to be mating later this month for some of our other features. Now, Ashton, I have to ask you because it almost looks like some of her scales are maybe a little bit cloudy or murky yeah. looking. So I didn't notice until we brought her into the sunshine. I was going to say the sunshine really, I mean, yeah, really when you were did. inside, it probably looked very different. No, she looked totally normal inside. I'm really glad we brought her outside because she is going opaque. She is. So yep. what that means is that snakes shed their skin and that's how they grow. They kind of come out of it. Like if you're taking out of a, taking off a sock, they'll actually come right out of their first layer of skin, shed it. And then underneath is a nice shiny new layer. So she is getting ready to shed and we will pull her off of handling yeah. right after this feature. <laughs> well, and that's such a good point that Ashton made because the reason why we don't typically handle snakes that are opaque or getting cloudy, it's mainly for their comfort. It's kind of an itchy, scratchy process. They got to get rid of all that extra skin, those scales. But it also is for our safety too because they don't have very good visibility yeah, during right. that time. And <laughs> it's just better to be safe than sorry, especially with any of our animals, regardless if they're snakes or not. But it is funny once you get an individual just like ourselves out in the sunshine, mm -hmm. a beautiful, let's say say spring day, <laughs> you get a little bit of a different perspective. Yeah. She surprised us. She like did that. surprise us. I love that. <laughs> well, Ashton, thanks so much for bringing Dillinger. We've learned so much. Like I said, everyone in the captions, go ahead. Keep asking all those great questions. And thanks so much, Ashton, Thank for joining us. I really nice appreciate it. You. Now, all of you Z learners... Earlier this morning, I went ahead and shared our schedule for the rest of March of all the different features that we are going to be doing. You might notice some that we haven't done before or maybe some kind of repeats. We've been in the garden before, but there's so much new to update you, especially in the spring. Now, I am going to give you a little bit of a teaser here in just a second. I'm going to make my way down the pathway because where I'm standing in front of right now is actually home to one of our newest animal residents. His name is Dan. And I'm giving you a really early teaser here because his feature is not until the end of the month. In fact, I want to say it's the 31st, but let me go ahead and turn around this camera because he is too handsome to ignore today. 
And since we were literally right here, look at that fuzzy. Oh gosh, you're so surprised. One of the goats just jumped over. <laughs> He's still getting used to all of his new neighbors, but this individual that we're looking at right now is Dan, the alpaca. And I'm gonna zoom back because that is all the more I'm going to give to all of you right now for your teaser before the rest of our Lunch and Z-Learn features for March. Thank you all once again for joining us live here today at Riverbank Zoo and Garden. And if you missed the schedule, just scroll up in our feed, either on Instagram or Facebook, and you'll get a great update of what does the rest of the month look like for all of our live features. Thanks so much, everybody, and we'll see you again soon.